I want to thank everyone that's shown up here tonight. Um, this is uh, exciting for me. A um, long time ago, I'm trying to figure out when, but it was uh, about a dozen years ago, I went to a conference on uh, basic income that was held within the Eastern Eco Economist Association. That's Eastern is in Northeast, not Eastern is in China. And as uh, the room is about this many people, representing a worldwide ranging number of people that were interested, but we felt very, very alone. I had discovered the issue of basic income working at ACORN, talk about that another time, but it was my job to clean out literally a closet that hadn't been cleaned out in 20 years. And in it, there was material from National Welfare Rights Organization. In fact, I took this button out of that closet. And in 1970, they had campaigned for a guaranteed income. It's a cash grant that is considered your share, right? You're a citizen. You should have a share of the prosperity in the country. And it stayed in my head. It never left me. And I thought a lot about it because my job was to knock on doors, sit on couches and get people to join a community organization of low-income people. And I thought over and over, this problem, that problem, because people were telling me about their problems, just some money would do a tremendous amount of good. Nurses in my classes on healthcare ethics talk about if they could prescribe a thousand bucks, that would often help a lot more than the medicine they're prescribing, which usually costs a thousand bucks, right? So more and more I start thinking about this, what seems like a relatively oversimplistic approach, but I keep seeing moments where it helps. And in all kinds of spaces, education, health, etc. So it's never left me. And one of the founders of the organization that put that conference together is Carl Widerquist, who's speaking tonight. Carl Widerquist teaches now at the School for Foreign Service, Georgetown, their campus in Qatar. Uh, his audience is international. It includes activists. In fact, there's some video that's just posted from a march in New York where I got to see Carl speak. That was last weekend. Uh, but also policymakers and economists. Carl um, studied at Oxford, has a degree in economics and one in political philosophy which is, I think, most of what he teaches at Georgetown, Qatar. And I've I benefited tremendously from his writings and his lectures. So it's a personal honor for me to introduce to you Carl Weiderkus. Come on up here. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm here today to talk about basic income which I believe was best defined when 20 years, 30, 20 years before the name was coined by G.D.H. Cole, it was best defined by Bertrand Russell, who called it a certain small income sufficient for necessities, should be secured for all, whether or not they work, and a larger income should be given to those who are willing to engage in some work which the community recognizes as useful. On this basis, we may build further. It is not the end of social justice. It's not all there is to a just society, but it is an important, and I believe, an essential part of a just society. It is, in and of itself, really a mild reform. All it means is to, if you don't do it, you can combine it with lots and lots of other far-reaching reforms. It can be combined with many different things. But if... All we do now is create a basic income. What, what, what we've done is created a situation in which we have a market economy where income doesn't start at zero. We need to think and realize that income doesn't have to start at zero. It is, so it's a mild and simple reform, but once income doesn't start at zero, there might be radical implications and radical justifications for this policy. Now, my name is Carl Wedderquist. I'm from Cassopolis, Michigan, and I support basic income because I think it's wrong for anyone to come between anyone else 
and the resources they need to survive. I think it's wrong to put conditions on another person's access to the resources that they need to survive. And I think we need to realize that that is exactly what we do in the world today. It's not, uh, it's not something that just happens, or it's not something that people cause to themselves. It is a situation that only other people can put you into. And other people have created this situation and put people into it. The idea that you should not put persons into a condition where they, where they lack the, the ability to support themselves and are unable to get the resources they need to survive shouldn't even be controversial. Animals have it. You don't find any animal that asks, has to ask the permission of some other animal in their species, may I use the resources of the earth to meet my needs? Ah, oh, they all just go out and do it. There's a, there is a, a world out there that has access to all animals. And early humans treated it in the same way. Our hunter-gathering brethren in certain parts of the world still do, as do some of our uh, simple agrarian, though agrar uh, our cousins who use simple agrarian techniques in the places where they're still allowed to, even prisoners, even people who've been convicted of crimes, we do not deny them access to food, shelter, and clothing. But we do that in the economic realm. It's like we make poverty a greater in some ways, lesser, you know, we don't lock up. Well, actually, we do sometimes lock up the poor, but that's not the main punishment for being poor. But we will, in some ways, punish the poor in ways we would not punish prisoners and convicted criminals. The poor, the propertyless, the fresh out of school, and I wouldn't ask anybody who is in between jobs is in danger of being in this situation where they don't have access to the resources they need to survive. Um, it, is, it is a violation. It, it is something that is caused by others. And what I mean by that is that the resources are out there. The world has been there. The world is the same as it was the resources are almost the same here as they were 20,000 years ago. Some of the important ones have been depleted, but the world is still there. And in between that time, governments and large private landholders, well, private landholders, large and small, have taken control of all the resources of the earth, divided it amongst themselves, and most of us didn't get a share. And most of us have not been compensated for the fact that we are now unable to access the common resources, because the resources that were all of the whole earth that were once common to all of us are now not common. No, uh, we have been given no compensation for that. The, that puts not just the poor and the destitute, but everyone who has to work for a living in the position where we have to go to someone with more property than us and work for them. Work is not working for yourself in the way we define it in the world today, the way we're used to. Work is going in and taking a job, taking orders, doing, doing what someone with more privileges than you wants you to do 40 hours a day, 40 weeks, uh, 50 weeks a year, 40 or 50 years of your life, doing what they want you to do for the best part of your day so you can get the money to do what you want to do for the other part of the day. Um, that you, you cannot simply take resources and use them to, start your, to hunt, to gather, to fish, farm, to start your own business, to start your own cooperative. All of that, the only access is through the owners. Now, so by ownership, by ownership that is not shared by all, it means that the owners of resources are imposing a duty on, on everyone. Um, what is property? That question was asked by Prudhomme over 150 years ago, and he came up with this idea that property is theft. And I don't think that's really the right answer. I think the right answer is property is a duty. When I own property, 
That means it's mine and you can't mess with it. Well, you own property, you own it, I can't mess with it. I am imposing a duty on you. What makes it mine is that I get to use it and other people don't. That's why it is mine and not ours or not simply available. Uh, so whenever someone takes property, they are imposing a duty on you that didn't exist there before. Once the human race had no duty to respect some other part of the human race's ownership of the earth. Now, a small portion of the earth's, of the earth's population controls all the earth, and the rest of us are under a duty. It's not a reciprocal duty. If I had my share of the earth, you had your share of the earth, it would be a reciprocal duty, then maybe it would be different. But it's what we call a non-reciprocal duty, where some have, some do not. Well, if you impose a duty on people, um, you should compensate them. If I, if I want you to do anything else for me, if I say I want to put you under a duty, I write up a contract, I get your signature on it, and even to make it enforceable, I have to get you to agree and somehow compensate you. But this duty, this really key duty in our society, has been uncompensated. And it's a one that especially needs to be compensated because it is a duty that makes it impossible for other people to make their best basic needs. If you impose duties, you owe them a compensa compensation. So I envision a society, when I think about basic income, I envision a society where you pay for the resources that you control and use up and, and use and own. And you get paid. You get paid, in turn, for the resources that other people use and own and control. So we're all simultaneously paying and simultaneously getting paid. So if you pay more than you receive in basic income, if your taxes are higher than you receive in basic income, that is, your, that is, a, that is a reasonable fee for your taking more and using up more of the Earth's resources than other people. When you are getting paid more in basic income than you pay in taxes on the resources you own or use or control, that means the extra you can spend on, spend on services provided by other people. And those services, the com consumption of those services are your reward for being someone who controls, who uses, and who uses up less resources than everyone else. That's fairness. That's a reciprocal duty. Those who take more, pay more. Those who are forced to take less because other people are taking more, consume services provided by those taking more. That is why we need redistribution and why the redistribution has to be in the form of an unconditional basic income or something very similar. Instead, we have a society that runs on fear, a society that runs on threats, on the threat of poverty. And poverty is a threat. And it's a threat that not just the poor are under. Unless you're independently wealthy, unless you have enough money that you could retire and never work another day in your life like the independently wealthy do, we're all under the same threat. And it harms us all to be under that threat, psychologically and economically in our, act, in our interactions with people who control the resources we need to survive. So it is something that is for all of us. Basic income is something for everyone who otherwise has to get a job to keep themselves alive. Um, and if you want not just to relieve poverty, and reduce poverty, but end poverty, to abolish poverty and end the threat of poverty, Basic income is the only policy that can do it. We have lots of people talk, 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 talk about how bad poverty is, how we need to get rid of poverty, but then they'll say, oh, but we, we have to do it with conditions. We have to hold, uh, we have to hold people to conditions in, when we relieve poverty. If you impose any conditions whatsoever, you cannot end poverty because 
in, if they're real conditions. If they're fake conditions, then fine. If you're putting fake conditions on, you can use all the conditions you want and eliminate poverty. But you cannot eliminate poverty and simultaneously really hold the recipients to real conditions. Because people will test you. They'll say, okay, you say I gotta do this condition, I'm not gonna do it, what happens to me? Well, if they don't do it, you've gotta kick them off of the program or you've got a fake condition. And then they're poor. So if you are saying, I wanna eliminate poverty and say, I wanna do it through conditional policies, you are not telling yourself the truth. You need poverty. If you like conditions, I want to make the, everyone do this and that and the other thing before they get the resources they need to get them out of poverty. You are saying, I need a certain level of poverty to exist because I want to threaten people with that in order to get them to meet these conditions. Maybe it's going to be lower than it is now, but it will exist. I suppose you could threaten them with somebody else. You could say, okay, we're gonna, you could relieve poverty. You could eliminate poverty with... Uh, with uh, conditions if you threaten them with like, okay, we're, but everybody who doesn't meet the conditions, we won't take their universal income support away, but we'll throw them in jail. If you want to throw people in jail who don't meet your conditions, uh, then you can do it with a conditional policy, but you can't meet it among free, free people without it. And people will make so many so many attacks on this idea of basic income. Some will say, isn't that communism or socialism? These really bad words. And they say, oh, I put a label on it, therefore I must be making a good point. Well, if communism and socialism have meaningful definitions, which I'm not sure they do in the United States, maybe in Europe they still do, but communism and socialism, I think I embrace the the new definition of communism and socialism is just anything, uh, uh, anything uh, right-wing people in the United States don't like is, is automatically, you just throw those labels on it. Uh, pro private, pro but if they have a meaningful definition, it is trying to build a society without private property, um, you know, as if, where the people as a whole will take control of the means of production. Uh, now, that really has nothing whatsoever to do with basic income. As a matter of fact, um, the Soviet Constitution it ruled out ever creating a basic income. They, they actually put in the idea that if you, if you do not work, you will, uh, those who do not work will not eat, right into their own constitution. So the Soviet Constitution is, if you're for basic income, the Soviet Constitution is against you. Uh, Private property is not the problem. A socialist economy can use the threat of poverty, economic destitution, and homelessness to get you to do what they want you to do just as much as a capitalist or a welfare capitalist economy or virtually any other kind of economy can use that threat. Well, I'm talking about relieving people from the threat. I'm assuming it's in the in the co context of a basically market society, because that's where I live, but you need the same thing in a basically socialist society as well. That's why uh, uh, the, the leader of the German party, Die Linke, which is German for the left, says, uh, describes why her party is in favor of basic income. She says the old left wanted to control the means of production. The new left wants to control our own lives. Having enough resources to control your own lives might be more valuable than having one vote in this giant socialist democratic consortium that controls all the means of production because they might treat you as an individual in ways that aren't so great. I have, as a matter of fact, now, so socialism on its own doesn't solve the problem, but private property isn't a problem. I have no problem with property as long as you pay for what you take. If you take something out of the commons, you pay back to everyone else because you're imposing a duty on them. And when you do this, when you create this economy where income doesn't start at zero, you're creating a voluntary participation economy. What we have now is a mandatory participation economy. We will threaten you with poverty 
destitution and homelessness if you don't go in and take orders from your betters every day. That, I don't think, is a good way to build community. I think it's a good way to build community if you want people to cooperate with you and think that they think that they should give back to you. You need to give to them unconditionally. If, if your first thing is, first, everyone who needs something, first you do something for us, the privilege who have something. Then we'll, then we'll give you something. Uh, you're, if uh, somebody, you put somebody in that situation, they're like, well, uh, I, you didn't give me nothing. First, you made me work and you paid for me. You, uh, you said you paid me great. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't think I paid that I didn't think the pay was all that great. You didn't do anything for me. You, oh, you took my labor and you paid for it. Um, that's not giving. Okay, I won't give to you then either. You didn't give to me. Uh, that, I think, is a very bad way to start out. We need to start out by being a society that acts like a community, that helps everyone. We're not going to judge you. We're going to help you. And then we're going to give you voluntary possibilities for you to join us and to work with us and help build us a community. But we're never going to force you. Which is the type of community that seems more inviting? The types of community that is really going to inspire you to want to join and to give to that community? There's the community with a mandatory participation in a community sounds paranoid and ungenerous and self-serving. Whereas the one that says, we're not going to judge you, we're going to help you, and then we're going to invite you to get a greater reward by helping us as well. We're in, but we'll never threaten you with lack of your basic needs. That, to me, sounds like the one I want to be a part of, the one that I want to give back to, the one that I will care about. If you bring up basic income, people will always ask a question, what about incentives? Oh, yes, very important. Um, we have an enormous incentive problem in the United States and most other countries today, and basic income solves it. I'm talking about, of course, the incentive problem that businesses lack the incentive to pay good wages. We have an enormous number of people living in poverty whose wages are below poverty. We're talking about for the fight for 15 to get minimum wages, to get a law put we have such an incentive problem that businesses have the incentive to get a low wage problem. There. We're trying to make a law to force them to pay a higher wage. We're admit we got to be admitting we got an incentive problem. We got to make a law that you pay somebody to work 40 hours a week, 48 weeks a year, and that and they're and they're gonna not pay enough. So that person can barely get by where they live. That's an incentive problem, and it's a it's a worldwide problem, and it's getting worse. Um, it's, it's getting worse around the world. Um, and it's not just about poverty wages, but it's about everyone's wages. We've become, we've so convinced ourselves that it is right and good for the prosperous to tell the less prosperous what to do. We get to impose these conditions on you. Oh, and the number one condition is if you want anything, you've got to work for the more prosperous. Uh, kind of a self-serving condition. But we've decided that that is right and good and good for most of us. We want to think of those basic income recipients as being those other people, those bad people, others. And we forget that we're in the same position. All people who have no other choice but to work for the position are in the same position where we need our job and we are Oh, and this same incentive problem is causing problems for us, even if we're not making poverty uh, wages. For example, 41 years ago, in 1978, gross domestic product was half of what it is now. So it's doubled. It's doubled in 41 years. But the prospects that, that the graduating class the graduating class that just came out of here in June of Elms College in, 19, in, in 2019, 41 years later than the graduating class of 1978. The prospects for those people are about the same as they were in, 
1978 and overall in real terms, that is real standard of living for a given amount of work. But our economy has doubled in size. Where did that money go? Well, you know, uh, most of it has gone to the top 1%. And think of what we could be doing with all of that if we didn't have this incentive problem where the top 1% has, has not had the incentive to share these benefits of economic, and growth, economic growth and automation that have happened over the last 41 years. If we had the incentive, that means we could all be working half as much. Everyone who graduates in 2019 might only have to work half as much to consume the same as those who graduated in 1978. Or they could work twice as much, or they could, sorry, they could work the same, no harder than they did in 1978, and consume twice as much. That would be the average we would expect. And in the past, that's what we could expect. Between the 1930s and the 1970s, that's what you could expect. People were working about the same and cons well actually working slightly less and consuming more than double in the 70s than they were in the 1930s partly because the incentive system was different it's in those years that we've been dismantling the welfare system giving people no other choice but to work that has created this in situation so this self-serving policy that we put in place the self-serving policy to uh the self-serving policy that we think is just going to make those other people do things for the middle class is actually harmed ourselves, the middle class. And that's why I think the incentive problem is so important to talk about when you talk about basic income. When I say that, people say, well, but that's not what I meant by incentives. So say, what I meant by incentives, what I meant by incentives was, was what about that incentive for those, those, those lazy workers, those lazy workers to go and, and work from place. What about these people who will never work unless you, uh, if they don't have to? Um, well, you, is there really a class of people who will never work if we don't have to? Is that what our, and, and then will work if we, if we force them to? Um, how do we know this? I know this is something that uh, prosperous people like to say when they're justifying new taxes, but Look at the way we look at this question. Look at, we always, we always hear about lazy workers who won't work, but you never hear about cheap employers who won't pay good wages. Isn't that strange? Because think about this other thing that is why, even more, I think, just as widely believed is this, is this phrase, everyone has their price. Well, if everyone has their price, if employers pay enough, people will take the job. You pay people enough, they'll do it. Um, uh, you pay people enough. Uh, so what we mean when we say there's these lazy workers who won't work, we mean they won't for work for the wages and the working conditions that we're offering them. We've got cheap employers, and yet we've, or, or we've got a whole society that is backing up cheap employers. But look, when we look at this dispute, we say people won't take jobs. And we don't even question what the wages are, whether the employees are cheap or not. We're looking at a dispute. Whenever one person won't take another person's job, that's a dispute about wages and working conditions. Yet, we, when we label, we put this label, lazy workers on the workers, and never cheap employers on the workers, we are pretending the dispute doesn't exist. We are protecting the privileged side of this dispute as if they were beyond reproach, as if they were not capable of doing anything morally wrong. We are, and we're putting in the position where this one side, the side of the dispute, um, where the vulnerable, where the weak and the poor are, this side gets morally judged, and that side is beyond reproach as if they weren't even party to a dispute as if there's no such thing as taking advantage of, a, or, of or exploiting a person who is in a situation so desperate that they'll take your non-living wage. And, there, and, we, we, and we intentionally put people into this situation so that they will take those non-wages. Uh, those, those non, uh, 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, we've been doing this. We have been intentionally putting people in this position gradually and gradually for hundreds of years. And intentionally. We don't talk about it now because it's largely complete. And we now we want to look back and get everybody to forget how we intentionally put people in this situation. But if you look back in history of what people were saying when, when they did it, they admitted it very much. They admitted it very often. The enclosure movement in Europe, well, it's, enclosure is the English name for it, and, the, and sort of a proper name for what happened in England, but very much the same thing happened throughout Europe um, at, at, over a gradual period of hundreds of years. And that's what you had before the enclosure movement. The landlords weren't yet landlords. They were just lords. And as just lords, they were kind of like the local government official, not really the local owner. Funny how owners today like to think of themselves that has nothing to do with government. And they'll tell these myths about appropriation of property as if uh, they weren't actually uh, inheriting a title given to them by a government. Uh, the local lords were more like the local magistrates, and they didn't really fully own the land. And the land was often communally shared by people who would have to pay taxes to the lords, but very often they had direct access to the land that they could use for agriculture. That they, they had some shared agriculture, and they had some individual agriculture, but on shared land, and they took turns using, and they had enough land for the groups to use. And they also had a commons where people could hunt and gather in the commons. And this gave people independence. And to the peasants of Europe, this independence was essential to the, what they saw as their freedom. And during the enclosure movement, the people who were saying, we have to enclose the commons and make it private property, were saying, look at these independent workers. They're so lazy. They don't take the jobs we offer. Well, nobody, well, they never said, well, look, look, they never, they could have just said, look how cheap I am. I have independent workers. Uh, I have independent people. They won't take my jobs because my wages are too low. And I don't want to pay higher wages. So I want to take their independence away. Aren't I cheap? Um, aren't I kind of cruel and, and aggressive? No, it's just, they're lazy. Um, and that was all said very intentional. There's a, uh, in, uh, there, there, are, there are historical pieces that, that chronicle people saying of this over hundreds of years. Uh, they did it again in the colonial movement when they got to Africa and India and found very similar ways that people had direct access to land. We have to, we have to civilize them. This is the white man's burden. We have to bring them into society. We have to take these possibilities away so they will learn to work for wages. And that will make them better. And they did it when they shot the buffalo. When our ancestors shot the buffalo, they did it not because they wanted the buffalo. They did it to gain control over the Native Americans. And the freed slaves knew this. After we inducted the slaves, and kept them for a few hundred years, and then said, OK, you're free now. Uh, General Sherman met with a man in Garrison, Frazier, and asked him, now that we freed the slaves, what do you, a freed man, freed slave, what do you need? And he said, we need land to till it by our own labor so we don't have to go to our former masters to work for them. And that's how the promise of 40 acres was mule, and a mule was made. And it was, of course, uh, and of course, Garrison Frazier asked for that because he knew it would give the slaves freedom and independence and get them off the plantation. But unfortunately, the former masters of the slaves knew, this, knew it would do that too. So they got that promise broken and created a situation where the former slaves had no other work, no other chance, no other choice but to work at hardly anything else but that same old plantation and service labor and the lowest labor in the South for the next hundred years. This was done. We've put the working people of the world in this situation very intentionally. But they will say, but also people will say, what, what about the work ethic? What about the work ethic where people should work, everyone should work, and everyone should work for what they get? Well, if that's what you believe, you should throw the market economy in the toilet, because that's not the market economy. 
Uh, capitalism is about the return on capital. It is about unearned income. It's about once you get capital, capital works for you. You don't have to work for it. So those of us who are in the position, a position where we have no other choice but to work are also working directly or indirectly for people who aren't held to any work ethic or work requirement, who simply live off of their capital. Uh, work is optional for capital owners and mandatory for the rest of us. So if you really want a true mandatory participation society, you've got to find a way to say capital owners have to work too, and they have to work the same amount as just, just the stuff. And the problems in our society with, our, with the incentive system we have in our society, it is not management that is, that is most, most highly rewarded. It is the ownership. We live in a society that rewards people who do stuff much less than people who own stuff. The one entrepreneur that was probably most praised in, in the recent decades with Steve Jobs for all he did to for the computer revolution. And so they say, this is what we want. This is what capitalism puts forward. Steve Jobs, and he made $8 billion, and that's why billionaires are okay. Well, let's compare him to uh, Lee, uh, Lillian Betancourt. You know who she is? Probably don't even know who that is. Lived the same time, at, at the same period, Liliane Betancourt, living the same period as Steve Jobs, made the same $8 billion. And you know what she made it as? Being the heir to the L'Oreal fortune. She didn't do anything. All she did was own, and L'Oreal stock took off. So she ended up with eight. She owned, she spent, she enjoyed life. And she ended up with $8 billion more, same as Steve Jobs. That's what capitalism is. So if you believe in a work ethic, you're the communist, you're the socialist, you're the one that has to take capitalism and get rid of it because capitalism isn't built on a work ethic. And the work for those employers is not a return on past ownership either. There is always any good that is scarce has a price and makes money, and anything that makes money has that isn't a human gives a return to its owner that is always unearned. There's an enormous amount of unearned income because of all the valuable assets we have. And all of that income, almost all of that income now is going to private people who do not themselves have to work. We need to tax that and, and give that for those who control the things that others have there. We're, we're taxing that, redistributing that, to others. Um, also, so this idea that basic income is something for nothing gets it exactly backwards. It gets the situation in the world today exactly backwards. All property is made of resources. Scarce assets always produce income for nothing. Those who own, control, pollute, and use up should pay back to everyone else. Uh, they paid the previous owners, but they have never paid you and me. Compensation is always in cash, and um, you contribute by offering fewer resources. They have all these rationalizations for private ownership, but you, really it's just a rationalization for private ownership without compensation. is just a rationalization for the selfishness of, they wanting to, of people wanting to take all the property and not sharing it. I'm not against private property in the market and trading. I think they're all fine if you pay for what you own with what your property is really made out of. It's made out of resources. No one invented the resources. You pay back. And that's why payback has to be, has to be unconditional. And that's why I support basic income. I support it because no one has the right to impose duties on you without your compensation. Because you have as much resources as much right to resource as anyone else, because it's wrong to come between you and the resources you need to survive, and because so many of us has been had a raise since the 1970s. And if we do this, if we do this, we can create a society that is really better for everyone. A basic income is a caring society, is a caring society, and a good society, and one that we could all be proud to live in, one that isn't 
parasitic off of all of our weakest members. I thank you for listening, and I'm happy to any questions at all you have about it. Okay, I'll turn that one on. And uh, you call on the people. Okay. You, you MC. First off, thanks again, Carl. Thank oh, you all thanks. for applauding. That was, any questions? Oh, good. Um, so I wanted to follow up on um, your pointing out the differences in incentives. So what is the incentive to get people who do have property to do what they should be doing? Well, um, uh, is that, sorry, you, you're done? Yeah. That's the question. Okay. Well, there, I mean, there's, there, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a simple and the difficult way to interpret that, interpret that question. The simple way is, is, is really easy, is that you, ha uh, you, um, you have a good law that says when you own things, you have to pay taxes on them and we will enforce these taxes and those who want to own the things made out of our uh, land and water and minerals will pay taxes on them or they will, or they will have the uh, uh, other, other they will, or they will have those things taken away in a good, uh, well-structured, well-enforced uh, tax system. So in that sense, economically speaking, it's really easy. But I'm guessing that your question has more to do with political economy, with uh, how do you get the laws passed to create that situation. And that, of course, is much difficult, much Different, and that actually leads me to a bigger problem. I, I actually got into basic income because uh, growing up in a small integrated town in the United States in the 70s, just after uh, the civil rights movement, uh, I was like, well, you know, Martin Luther King solved that whole racism problem. That was our biggest problem. Now what's our biggest problem left? And well, that's gotta be the way we treat the poor. Okay, that was rather naive. I didn't. Uh, uh, racism was far from dead, I learned later. But I started working on this problem. Of course, we have lots of other problems, militarism, the pollution of the environment that we're living, all these other problems. And but this problem, inequality has just continued to get worse. And the treatment of the homeless and the, and the poor and the destitute is the worst of it. But another aspect of it is the enormous control that wealthy people have over our political process, which is, it's, it, I, I mean, these things are tied together, but you, it's hard to solve the one without the other, is that legislation in the United States and, and many other so-called democracies are also uh, are like the United States in that it overwhelmingly reflects the preferences of the 10% wealthiest people. If you can get, if you get a, a really big majority for a certain thing, but it's, but, but it's a minority of the people in the top 10% of the income or wealth distribution, it is very unlikely to become law, law despite its enormous support. Yet, it can be supported by a small minority, but if that group supports it, very often they can. And this is from because of campaign contributions and other things that give such a disproportionate share. We can't say that we live in a democracy unless we solve this problem. We don't live in a true democracy today. We don't even have a word for it. Uh, we don't have a word for a, a cacistocracy, which is, the, the, which is uh, run by the least uh, the, 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 the least able people, aristocracy run by the most able. We have kleptocracy run by criminals. We have all these names, but we don't have a name for, uh, for something that is, has you vote, so it's kind of a democracy, but it is so controlled by money in the process. It's kind of a corrupt democracy, a dirty democracy. We need a, some sort of ocracy for that. And we've got to fight that. We've got to fight the control of the, the control of money in our process. And it hurts, it's not just that 
And the wealthy controlling our money process don't just want low taxes. They also, at the same time, want giveaways from the government. So the government is always buying things for wealthy people, like, oh, we'll build you a football stadium and a baseball stadium. Or we'll we'll uh, subsidize whatever it is you're selling. We'll give the uh, free roads for the because the because the uh, oil, gas, and tire, and, and automobile companies want free roads. We'll build those for you. Put your stoplights up for you. But we won't subsidize Amtrak because nobody rich is paying us to subsidize Amtrak. Um, we got to end that. Now, now if you want to go, OK, so we got to solve that enormous problem. But there's another, there's another way around it, is that basic income in and of itself is not such a bad deal for rich people. Um, when Frederick Douglass came north, he was shocked to find rich people in the north because all the rich people in the south owned slaves. So he thought, you can't be rich unless you have slaves. And at the same time, in Germany, Karl Marx saw this horrible uh, uh, poverty in this capitalist country, and he thought you can't have a market economy without this horrible exploitive poverty. But I think neither of those are true. And it's not, such a it's not such a bad deal for the wealthy to just pay some taxes, pay some taxes, and live in a world where no one is so desperately poor that they're going to take these poverty wages and that they don't have to constantly worry about how is it for me living in a world where I am the target of these such underprivileged people. So uh, yeah, I think the concern you point out is huge, but there's three levels levels of ways around it. OK, now, I'm really bad at pithy answers. I think I took up an enormous chunk. I'm going to throw a question out, because I, yeah. I think a lot of people would, might say, I'm ready yeah. to see a provision that secures independence for everyone. Yeah. I just don't think it, it, we can afford it. It must be outstandingly expensive. So if anything you mm -hmm. can say to that effect, I think would help. And also, just. What do we tax? How do we put it out? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a little nuts and bolts and how expensive it would be would yeah. help us. Well, with basic income, basic income is income given to everybody. And that makes people think that it's going to be real expensive because they're going to take the size of the population and multiply the basic income by the size of the population and get this some enormous figure and say that's what basic income costs. That is not the cost of basic income because most of us aren't going to be net recipients. You're going to, we're all going to pay the basic income, but we're also all, we're, we're going to pay the taxes that support the basic income, but we're also going to receive the basic income. So you're paying and receiving at the same time. For most of us, the amount we receive in basic income is also going to be covered in, in, in our own taxes. So the government is going to tax you, they're going to add something to your paycheck for basic income and take something off your paycheck for the taxes to cover it. And those two things just cancel each other out. That doesn't cost you anything. The cost is those who pay more, how much more do they pay? More in taxes than they receive in basic income. And those who receive more than they pay in basic income, what do those receive? And those two are going to be roughly equal. A little bit different because of administrative costs and also that, that we don't necessarily need one tax dollar for every new bit of spending to keep inflation in check. A little bit different, but that's about the same thing. And when you look at that, if you take a poverty level basic income, which has a gross cost, a gross cost of something in the neighborhood of uh, uh, two uh, two, uh, no, sorry, three to uh, two, two, um, two point five to three trillion dollars. The net cost of that is only five hundred and thirty-nine million dollars per year, according to the calculations I did a couple years ago. Two hundred, uh, five hundred and thirty-nine million dollars a year is um, is only two point nine five percent of GDP. It is, um, it is roughly 15% of what we're now spending on all transfer payments and entitlements. Um, what's that? Oh, does I mean, oh, sorry, billion. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to keep that. Though. We shouldn't, all our, num our big numbers shouldn't all rhyme. I know. That, <laughs> what a horrible idea. Because what was the percentage of the GDP again? 2.95% uh, of GDP. Would, make, would abolish poverty. Would abolish poverty. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just not that expensive. And actually, then some of that, you could even save more than that if 
if you say, well, what pro program could we replace uh, unemployment insurance for this? Could we replace the first $12,000 of Social Security with this? Could we replace uh, other things with this? Um, that would make it even more affordable. Any other questions? Oh, good. Um, ha are there any countries currently that are successfully based on the basic income system or, or close to it? Or? No, not yet. Um, there is a small version of, in Alaska. And Alaska has a dividend that has been as high as $3,000 in a year, which if you think about, say I'm a single mother with three kids, that's $12,000, which if you got three kids, that's not going to alone get you out of property. About $12,000 to a single mother with kids is a lot of money. Uh, but other years, it's only $1,000. And more off later, it's been closer to $1,000. Thousands, not as much, it's not as significant. There is no country that has so far put in a truly unconditional basic income large enough to do all this to meet your basic needs. Um, but people, countries have been moving in the direction of easing up their conditions and making their condition, making what they have more generous. And you far, and what you find is as you move in this direction, some of the negative effects get less and some of the costs go down, and some of the positive effects get better. The fewer children you have growing up in poverty, the better off everyone is, those children themselves, and the rest of society is for the rest of that child's life. So we can find by, by countries who've moved in this direction that moving farther in this direction is a good idea. No one's tried it yet, so it'll be really revolutionary when the first country actually puts this full idea into practice. Carl, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Let's give him a big hand. And he's available here. If folks have a couple questions, just come right to him. I want to thank everyone here for showing up. And uh, yeah, I'm available too if folks want to talk more about it. Thank you all very much.